Hello, all my entrepreneurs and business leaders, and welcome to The Michael Esposito Show, where I interview titans of industry in order to inform, educate, and inspire you to be great. My guest today is a retired professional football player, notably playing for the Seattle Seahawks, and the CEO of Candor, a partner-focused cloud solution provider, helping businesses scale faster, streamline processes, and solve challenges. Please welcome Dave Philiston. Welcome, Dave. Hey, Michael. How are you? Doing great, thanks. Um, it's it's really exciting to have an ex athlete on 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 my show today and on my show in general. And uh, you know, I, I kind of want to reframe that. It's it's not ex athlete because we're always athletes. Uh, I consider myself an athlete, and I had never played professionally. So <laughs> no, for sure. I, you know, we always try to you know stay at it. I'm still you know very involved in you know obviously my athletic, uh, you know, working out and staying on top as well as sports. So now it's changed a little bit. Now I got my, my kids that I'm, you know, seeing them kind of develop into T-ball and, you know, following their sports passions as well. So it's just kind of, it, it transforms, so to speak. It does transform. There's, there's so much around the athletic mindset that I, I want to talk about. Um, you, you attribute football as being uh, such a key part to your life and your growth. And I'm sure that there's so many habits that you learned on the football field and obviously in the locker room that you take to your new company as the CEO. Um, I, I would love to make that relationship. Uh, I, I would just like to uh, start off with a little bit about your history. So I just touched on that about you know growing up playing football. Uh, take walk us through your story of of how you got into football and and what that was like in the pee wee leagues and all that stuff that you did growing up. Yeah, sure, sure. So you know, uh, originally I was born in Brooklyn, New York, uh, and you know my around the four or five, uh, my mom moved to Manchester, New Hampshire, uh, with me and my brother. I got an older brother. Uh, we're about uh, eight years apart. Um, so he started playing football first, right? So he needed a, you know, a after school activity to do. He's a fairly, you know, big, uh, big guy. And, you know, uh, basically my mom said, Hey, you either got to get a job or you got to play some sort of sports, but you sticking around after school and not really getting much done, uh, isn't working. So, you know, he ended up playing football. He ended up excelling in it. I ended up seeing that from afar and I'm like, hey, this might be a, a good avenue. I, you know, I, we played a lot of video games in the day when it came to Madden. Um, so when it came to, you know, playing Pee Wee, I was like, man, maybe this might be good for me. So, you know, fast forwarding, we, we start this Pee Wee thing. You know, I'm out of shape. I don't have much discipline when it comes to what the coaches are asking. I remember them always being in my face. And this is during a different time, right, where, you know, coaches can really, you know, get after you a little bit uh, in the sense of uh, trying to motivate you. Um, so I took that as a challenge. And I just remember myself slowly getting into uh, more of a comfort with football when it comes to, you know, uh, tackling, right? Tackling is one of those things where you, when you're young, it's kind of, you want to kind of, you know, crunch up a little bit and not open your eyes or your arms. But over time, I felt like I'm starting to adjust, and this football thing is coming a little bit more natural for me. Um, so, you know, during the time of their learning as a, you know, mighty might and peewee leagues, we jump into more or less a, a different league uh, for junior high school. And this is where I'm getting in, into my, you know, I grew a foot in one year from sixth grade to, you know, seventh. You know, I'm starting to get strong. I'm starting to get a little bit more confident. Um, so from that, you know, a lot of the aspects when it comes to football, such as strength and speed and, you know, your ability to have some, you know, footwork is really coming into play for me. Um, so I jumped in and, and you know, from that, uh, I started excelling. I started going, you know, to these football camps out of New Hampshire to get more, um, you know, coverage as far as, you know, football is not really, uh, New Hampshire is not known for football. So uh, we go on out. I have cousins in, in Florida. So I went to University of Miami uh, when I was a freshman in high school for exposure, Florida State. And then from that, uh, you know, these coaches wanted to kind of stay in contact with me. So, you know, football has been a lot for me uh, as it comes to my discipline. I'm sure we'll jump into some of where I applied on the business front. But, um, you know, sports in general, right, uh, these are kind of the avenues that really I feel like really – progress me into where I am at today when it comes to, you know, attention to detail and, and really being dependable uh, on that. So you know, we won, you know, four state championships uh, in high school. I, I tell my, uh, my buddies that uh, I went to the University of Maryland, 
uh, for a full full scholarship. So I tell my buddies about you know my experience in winning four state championships. They never believe me. We only lost four times in my high school career, so I wasn't used to losing. Um, and you know these are kind of the things in the football crowd uh, in which you know guys are like, wow, you know this is this is amazing, right? You got four rings, and I'm like, yeah, very fortunate when it came to that. So. It's always it's always good uh, storytelling by a campfire, if you will. Yeah, I mean, and and that says a lot about your your character and your team's character and and what was happening in that locker room and, and your coaches. And I know that you you mentioned one of your high school coaches in here, uh, Jim, um, and and how much of an impact he had on your life. So obviously, it, football had a huge impact on your life, and you learned a lot. And I have a lot of questions inside of there, and, and we're going to definitely relate a lot of them to the entrepreneurial journey. But why don't you share a little bit about Jim with us and and uh, his impact in your life as well while we're on that subject. Yeah, fantastic. You know, uh, Jim Schubert, um, you know, a father figure uh, for me to this day. I didn't have much of that growing up. Uh, He definitely took me under his wing and my brother as well. You know, I owe him my life, right, Uh, in a sense. I know it sounds kind of like extreme, but he's really taken me to a point where, you know, um, during, you know, the teenager and knowing everything and, you know, getting into, you know, situations that may have been ideal for me and stressing my mom out, you know, Jim has really provided, you know, a, a framework for me to follow on, hey, do you want to see yourself here? Excellent communicator um, when it comes to working with uh, young adults or young, you know, young teenagers, if you will, um, and has really been monumental for my development. Um, uh, Coach Jim Schubert, um, if anybody from here is from Manchester, New Hampshire, they recently, about five years ago, named... Uh, Gill Stadium, which is a, you know, in Manchester, you, you would know where Gill Stadium is. They recently named it after him just, you know, based on, you know, his accolades when it comes to being a head coach. Um, but it's now called, you know, Jim Schubert's uh, football field, essentially. So he's, he's done wonderful things within the community, very well known within, um, you know, New Hampshire itself for what he's done on the, you know, the ranks of football and just kind of, uh, for some of his mentorship programs. And, you know, I, I think of him as a, you know, again, a father figure and, you know, I'm, I'm very blessed and fortunate to have someone like him in my life. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's people like that, that, that help us in various different ways. So it's not just on the football field, as you mentioned. And, and some of the things that you mentioned in your bio is that, you know, he, he fast tracked your maturity level. Um, could you speak to us a little bit about that, about your maturity level at the time and what he was able to do for you off the field? Yeah, no, it, it was his ability to challenge you in a, in a good way. You know, during the time, uh, eighth grade going into freshman year, um, you know, there was weightlifting that we can get in preparation for. We had to walk from uh, our, high, our junior high school to the, uh, our high school that we would be attending, and it was two days a week. It was Tuesdays and Thursdays, and there was a check-in sheet. And he challenged us to say, hey, we know you have a lot of things going on. We want you to have, you know, above 85% uh, show up, right? So we sign in, we go through the, uh, the program as which the strength and conditioning program. And that, that there was almost like accountable, right? You want, you know, people in business in life, you want them to be accountable. And how do you, you know, uh, instill that into an individual uh, being so young? Uh, it, it was just a perfect get, uh, segue into, you know, what, why he was so important and monumental and and not just my life, a lot of, you know, uh, people's lives in the area. Um, so he, he challenged us, right. It was like, Hey, all right, well, it's New Hampshire, we get weather, right. So sometimes it's not ideal weather. And we always had to, you know, find a way to make it down there, let it be from walking in a group. But some of these, uh, you know, individuals that were a part of, you know, this football program or, um, Jim Schubert's kind of, uh, they're my friends to this day. So we all share that kind of monumental bond of what he's provided to us. So, Mm. um, you know, forever thankful on that front. Yeah, I think we, we find that with championship teams. And then as we move on into the entrepreneurial and the business world, we find that it, it's not what happens on the field or in the the work environment or the, the conference room, right? It, it's the things that you do outside of there. And um, some of the things, the keys that you just shared there that Jim provided were accountability, 
challenging the workforce, right? Challenging the team and then communicating. It's it's something else that we, we speak about in the business world about communicating your vision, communicating your thoughts and ideas. And um, obviously he communicated his vision with you guys because you guys were four times champions. So that that is phenomenal. Um, again, just, just using this as kind of like the foundation to us speaking about the entrepreneurial journey. Let's speak about championships, right? Let's speak about that winning feeling and, and what it takes to be a winner. I think we, we hear a lot about overnight successes and people don't realize the amount of work that goes into it. So just speaking about practice and speaking about the camps and everything that went into being a championship team and then how that relates to some of the work that you're doing today. Totally, totally. I think how it all, you know, being that young and having that success um, within football, it's really helped my confidence, right? It's mm-hmm. like, hey, you know, we put in the hard work and I know, you know, in scenarios, you can still put in the hard work and, you know, do all the right things and things may not pan out. But, you know, sometimes you got to be more involved in, in more or less the journey of where you've gotten to. And I think from, you know, that perspective of things, you can control what you can control. You know, I, I have lost games in college as well as uh, professionally. So, you know, it's just one of those things and how you kind of bounce back from that. But I, I truly believe uh, when it came to the preparation You know, we were doing things like my motivation was playing football, right? So the grades that I received, what I've done uh, on the, you know, academic side of things was all motivation of, you know, getting to that goal of getting to college and, you know, later playing in professionally. So it helped me navigate, like, I need to stay on track. I know if I were to do these actions or get in trouble for this or not, you know, I missed this mark, this can affect my overall um, goal, what I wanted to get to. Right. Mm. And knowing that young, that maturity aspects of things, it's, it, I think it's a great deal of why, um, you know, people play sports, you know, the camaraderie that you get from winning a championship with these guys, uh, four times. And, you know, uh, it's, it's unbelievable. I think, you know, I'm getting the shivers back. I know it's, <laughs> been a, it's been a long time since I played uh, high school football, of course, but I'm just enthusiastic about, you know, where have I, where have I been if it, that wasn't, you know, I didn't go through that process, right? Mm-hmm. It would be hard to, to really put in words. But um, what I can say is that the camaraderie, um, you know, what it's done for me right now is that I'm going to instill those same morals and in, uh, into my family, right, and my kids to let them know that, hey, you know, we got to make sure that we're attention to detail. Same with you know, our, our businesses, right? Let's get attention to detail uh, when it comes to the small things, right? And then, you know, from that, you know, we're, we're – we're slowly getting to where our goals are, right? As an organization is, you know, being a leader. But I think a lot of that transition is from uh, the sports realm of things. Yeah, yeah. There's so much around the athlete's mindset, and and I mean, it, there's a lot of different hobbies out there. And but today we're just talking about the athletic mindset. Um, I, you know. Yeah. LeBron James did a really good uh, series on YouTube on on these different uh, basketball and one basketball team in particular, I believe, uh, that he followed a high school basketball team. And you're right, the impact that the sport had on these these student athletes and and the environment that they're being raised in and that's around them. And in, in fact, people in their communities looking out for them and saying, "Hey, look, he's got a career ahead of him. You know, let's let's keep him off the streets. Let's get him to bed early. Let's keep him out of this house or kind of thing." Uh, seeing that in that documentary was very helpful for for us to. To, to really witness that. Um, I, I'd like to kind of just stay on that because you mentioned also uh, being a 12-year-old boy and, and you, you, you bring up your mom in that situation. And while, while we're in here, um, could you share a little bit around growing up and, uh, and then how that you know, changed your life, right? I mean, we, I know we're, we're on this a little bit, but I, you, you highlighted mom in this. So I kind of wanted to just touch on that while we're still here. <laughs> Indeed, man. Uh, my lovely mom. Yeah. So you know, my mom is, I'm first generation uh, Haitian American, right? So, um, I, my, my mom. So I had a feeling. So this is this is um, this is crazy. We did not talk about this before we started, but um, I don't know sure. if you know, but I'm half Haitian. Oh. <laughs> Yes. Oh, I had no idea, dude. I, really? I had a feeling because I read your brother's first name, and I was like, "That's a Haitian name." Oh, and you know, jo- Jocks, Jockin, <laughs> Jacqueline. Yeah. yeah, you know how the Haitians do. Oh, I did not. 
Whoa, this is out of character uh, here. Huh? The, How cool is this? This is wild. I, Dude, for real? Yes. Yeah. I had I had a feeling based oh, okay. off of your name and and your your brother's name, like I said, but we we didn't have much time to to interact. Uh, my mother is uh, first generation. She's she's Haitian. She came here uh, okay. from Haiti. Uh, so it, it's just wild. So when you just Ooh. said that, I was like, whoa. <laughs> That is fantastic. Okay. Whoa. Okay. We got to catch up. Okay. Uh, <laughs> dude, I had no, uh, that's, look, imagine that, uh, whoever would have thought. Yeah. Yeah. That's well, cool. we'll, we'll talk more after the podcast, but go ahead. Tell us more about your mom being first generation Haitian American or you, you being first generation. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, she came, uh, obviously being first generation born in, in Brooklyn. Um, I know how hard she's worked, right. Um, you know, to kind of, she, she came from France initially and then, you know, over to here with an opportunity, and she's a nurse to this day. So, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, perspective gets put into that, right? Of, of the dedication that she's put into uh, raising my brother and and myself, and making sure that you know we had a better up. You know, like the stuff parents do, right? In the sense where we're able to. I remember being young and having a lot, a great deal of responsibilities because she was working quite a bit, you know, on that. So, you know, uh, being in Manchester, New Hampshire, it's you know, obviously not as diverse as Brooklyn, but we did have uh, a group of, you know, uh, you know, Haitians and other ethnicities and, and that we could, you know, lean on and, you know, they're a new too, right? So it's just kind of, you know, uh, learning from the community aspects of things and, you know, leaning on them uh, when it comes to, you know, the right and wrong stuff. I, you know, I came from the generation where we were kind of riding the wave before the internet occurred, right? So we're outside, we're doing you know, activities outside and, you know, transitioning to AOL, uh, it's the messenger and dial up where we had to say, Hey, call me back, call me back later because I had to use this phone to get on the internet. So I, I kind of have this, you know, hockey stick kind of trajectory when it comes to technology and, you know, things before, uh, we had broadband internet, things of that nature. But, you know, for, for my mom, her hard work, I know she's always raised me to be please and thank you. Um, and I think that's how it's been monumental for, you know, kind of what I, you know, where I'm at today is, you know, I think, uh, having manners and being polite and, and respecting others, uh, can go a long way. And I feel like, you know, uh, I got to thank my mom for that, even though she wasn't around quite a bit, it, it hasn't gone unnoticed. So, right. Oh, and her name, please. Uh, her, her, uh, made in, uh, Elizabeth Murphy, essentially, but you know, Haitians call her Bebet. Hey, Bebet, uh, como ça va? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, well, that, that's really great. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, being, being raised with respect obviously translates into the different worlds that, that you were in. So we're going to transition out of football, but before we do, uh, um, we're going to kind of like lead into where you are today. Um, just speaking about your football career. So you, you graduated the, the university of Maryland, right. Um, on a full scholarship for football, and then you entered uh, professional football. Um, just tell us a little bit about that experience, because I know in your bio, you said you wanted to be playing as long as Tom Brady, right? <laughs> yeah. Like anyone else, huh? He's really doing it, making a killing. Um, yeah, so, you know, went to University of Maryland. Um, awesome opportunity. Um, I was in the DMV, you know, area. Um, you know, one thing I I remember saying, and my brother lived in Norfolk, Virginia at the time, um, is that, you know, my upbringing on the football side of things there, uh, coach under Coach Ralph Friedgen, has been fantastic. I know we didn't get to win any, you know, national championships, but uh, the university has always been good to me and, and my family. So, uh, yeah, kind of, you know, presenting opportunities. Uh, I got a chance to go to the Seattle Seahawks, right? Um, you know, we, at the time, uh, what they call it is a PFA. It's a priority free agent. I didn't get drafted um, in my draft. And, you know, I was kind of bummed about that. But, you know, like anything else, we got to control what we can control. But I did get a, a couple of different opportunities when it came to, um, being able to go to different teams and, you know, be a free agent, which I, I wanted that opportunity. I, you know, for me, it was like, just give me a chance and I'll be able to take, take it from there. Um, so we ended up going across, you know, cross town or, or cross country in a sense uh, to uh, Seattle, uh, which was fantastic. I'd never been out there. It's a very beautiful, uh, you know, city and uh, Washington's a very beautiful state. So, you know, from that, you know, uh, competing, being out there, um, you know, awesome organization. And, and one thing I would say, Michael, about the NFL is, you know, their, their business model is so 
fine tuned. Like I remember just being a part of all the planning that goes into games or for, let it be from the logistics, let it be from the equipment guys. Um, there's a lot of strategy around like timing, you know, at our facility, there's clocks everywhere. Timing is, is crucial in the game of football and, you know, it's a battle of inches. Um, so the business aspect of things is something that I was always very intrigued with and how they were able to facilitate that when it came to um, coordinating travel, you know, you know, behind the scenes when it, it just, it, it's always, uh, you know, one of the things I bring up is that, you know, it, individuals that played, you know, a long tenure, you know, within the NFL and they come out from this, this system of, uh, you know, a billion dollar system it, and you're not learning anything from it. It's always tragic, right? Because I'm mm-hmm. like, you guys are a part of this system uh, of the NFL in which that, you know, they're generating all this money and they're, you know, uh, essentially uh, making more than some countries. It's always tragic when you see them, you know, not really benefit from that uh that opportunity, I would say. You know, what's what do you see as the difference in that? So I'm I'm thinking about just you know we, we think about business leaders, entrepreneurs, and we we see the ones that have great opportunities. You know, they they go to great colleges or um, great uh, family backgrounds where there's a lot of money behind them or whatever, but um, can't seem to get over the hump or or even see what you and I kind of see with what you're saying there. What do you what do you perceive as this challenge being around that? Seeing obviously successful. Uh, former athletes and then those who um, maybe weren't able to, to be as successful? I think, you know, I had a dialogue with a couple buddies at once. I think, you know, one of the things that came up is that they feel like the money will never end. Like they can play football forever mm. and those checks will just keep coming in and keep coming in. And from that mindset, it's almost like you're invincible. Like I'm going to make the money, you know, why not spend it? It's there. Um, and that's just not the case, right? The NFL is, you know, not for long for some folks, right? But at some point, Tom Brady's no longer going to play, right? It's just the reality of, you know, life in, in the NFL. So it's just really, you know, I think they've done a good job of identifying. And I feel like the, the maturity of, you know, players entering the NFL now is that they get that. I think that's one of the things that we need to hammer home is that, though, yeah, you're making – you know, X amount a year and it's fantastic and you feel like they'll never run out, you know, let's plan for that rainy. There's nothing wrong with having a backup plan. Mm. Right? It doesn't make you any more insignificant. You know, it makes you a better planner, right? So I think that's important for, you know, future generations of NFL uh, talent. Mm. Yeah, it's it's funny because it's such a um, it's a funny thing because they're living in the moment is really what they're doing right, which is uh, coming from like uh, I'm I'm learning a lot about meditation and I've I've started practicing that for the past year and and probably will be a lifelong a meditator uh, because of the impact that it has and so it's like all about li- being in the moment when you meditate but in this situation it's kind of like they're living too much in the moment and they need to see outside of that which kind of leads me to another question which is um, about like just going back to your youth and back to the football life of of you're wrapped around as an athlete, right? Your, your, your sport almost identifies you. And there's so many documentaries around, around this. There's, there's a great one on HBO that I just watched about the Olympic athletes. And uh, sadly, it talks about the, the, the suicide rate for Olympic athletes because their identity is the athlete. And then when they can no longer compete or they can no longer go to the Olympics or win championships or, or gold medals, it, it's depressing for them. So um, just speaking about that identity, um, w- what can you make as a suggestion? suggestion or, or some changes that you can maybe see in, in these athletes that are growing up in the peewee leagues or in little league or whatever it is that their sports they're playing, uh, what can we do? What can we provide them that when they do come out of being an athlete, so maybe they're just graduating high school and their you know, professional career is not there for them, or they finish as, an ex- as, a, as a retired football player like yourself, what, what are the things that we can start from that level uh, to help them? Very awesome question there, Michael. I, you know, for, you know, think of these, these athletes, right? They, they're having over 10,000 hours dedicated to their craft, we'll say, right? From growing up, from weightlifting, perhaps to practice and, you know, other aspects of things to really help their, their primary sport, right? So, you know, that's your, almost your identity, right? People know them at, oh, you're the soccer player or football player that, you know, did X, Y, Z. And at the time, you know, they're kind of molding you into this identity-based aspect of your own self. So when you get to the point where that, that's no longer applicable 
And, you know, I think, you know, that for me, I had to, you know, seek therapy, right? When I couldn't, you know, when I made the decision to say, hey, you know, maybe the NFL isn't what we need to be doing. You know, this is, you know, maybe I need to make that transition uh, into our, our backup plan, our strategy, which I've, I've always had when I've always talked about it. But, you know, nevertheless, I was hoping to have that Tom Brady type of uh, uh, career. But I strongly believe having, you know, a way in which that these athletes have at least some sort of path to be able to talk about, like, hey, yeah, you're, you're still mad. You still have a great deal of your life to live, though you're not playing sports. And, you know, what does that mean? I think it's just one of those things like, you know, mental health, right? We're, you know, since the pandemic, this has been such a, uh, a focal point for, you know, individuals is that, you know, a lot of people are living at home during the pandemic and COVID. But, you know, the segue back into your, your, your question is that, you know, we definitely need to have uh, methods in which the athletes can maybe perhaps reach out to other athletes and say, how'd you do it? You know, what was your success? You know, you've talked about meditation, big, you know, meditation here has, has been huge for me, right? Um, so I think it's just more or less having that conversation and letting them know that, yeah, you can be, you, you, look, you've done this most of your living life. A lot of the skills that, and, that you've gotten from sports, you can apply it to your everyday life in, in the workforce or whatever you want to put your mind to. I mean, the framework is there for you to, to be able to do that. And I think that's more or less, you know, what we should be, uh, you know, setting ourselves up for in the sense. Mm, yeah, and uh, and I think you you mentioned it earlier on too about you know being in in, in the NFL and even if you don't make it that far, uh, just being in this this athletic environment or whatever it is that you do if you're a musician and being in band and and seeing all the different things that are happening around you. Like you said, it, you know, you guys worked off of a clock and and all these different sports or hobbies or whatever it is that that you're in. There's always some kind of structure around, and if you can, yeah, you might be like you said, I identified as the football player or um, whatever it is, the musician, the, the guitarist or whatever it is, um, you might be identified as that, but there's other things happening around you. And if you pay attention to those things and you're mindful of those things using our meditation kind of analogies here, um, and you can start paying attention to those things, you can carry them on into uh, the real world. And then another thing that you mentioned in there too, that I think is really important is that what you're doing right now in the present doesn't identify who you are as a whole. It's it's one aspect of your life. It's a, it's a piece of your life. Um, you, you're nodding along, so I, I, you, you jump right in. Go ahead. No, I, I, I second that. I think the whole mindset is that, listen, you, you know, a lot of in which that, you know, when it comes to your yourself right now is that, I feel like as if during my upbringing, and it may just not be the, so much the case at the moment, but it's, it's almost like when it comes to having a plan or just kind of like, hey, right now this is kind of my current circumstances, like a lot of people get kind of wrapped around the axle around, hey, what am I going to, I think, you know, you live in the present, understand, you know, kind of your limitations and areas that you want to, to maneuver to, and then you build that path in order to get to your end goal. Mm. And I, and I strongly believe when it comes to, you know, you know, trying to boil the ocean, I call it, right. I think that approach, it doesn't work, right. It's just let's, you know, let's building blocks this thing here and we'll slowly get to kind of more or less our, our end result by, you know, preparation, planning, and, you know, execution essentially. So that that's great preparation planning and execution and um and i know we we've talked a lot about football and we can we will we will continue to talk about football because <laughs> because this is this is a fun topic but what you just said there and and kind of taking little bite size or small chunks as tony robbins would say you don't eat a, a whale in one bite you take it in small chunks it, it's the same thing yep. in the entrepreneurial journey and it's the same thing in the business journey of, of cr- climbing up the corporate ladder it's um the the goal can be ceo uh and and that's great and that's a great goal but you're not going to do it overnight take it in small little steps and i really like your little your, your steps there which are you know to, to prepare plan and then execute um which which play into uh you going into the it world so um you mentioned a few things and one of them was you seeked help and and i think that that's really important to highlight as well because um so many entrepreneurs and business leaders um and by the way i identify business leaders as people in in the corporate world trying to climb the corporate ladder 
we try to do it our, by ourselves. I mean, you may have, I know I have, try to do it by ourselves and we don't realize that there's people around us who want to help us. And even going to the mental health portion, which I, I would love for you to speak on or anything else, um, how that's really helped you in the IT world because you made a big transition from football then to moving into an IT company and this is your second as you mentioned, right? So I'd love to hear a little bit about that help that, that came around you and helped you make that transition. Sure. Um, so I think, you know, one thing for me, I've always been in technology, right? I've always let it be from, you know, building my computers, you know, to video games. You know, I've always had some sort of, you know, understanding uh, about technology in the sense of, you know, how I felt about it. Um, you know, segueing into kind of, you know, therapy, you know, one thing, you know, is still to this day and that needs to change, obviously, is the stigma around someone seeking help or someone being almost a, uh, their brain has gotten them, they're captive, they're prisoner of their own brain because of their thoughts, right? And they think they're insignificant because of, you know, how they're feeling. I mean, you know, uh, things like this, you know, it's, it's good to, to almost be, you know, real yourself and just say, hey, I just, sometimes I just need help. And, and what it helped me with is, you know, you know, during the time of that transition of saying, you know, I'm no longer going to play sports and I'm having identity issues young, it's, it's made me to this day, and you know, I'm 35, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful that I went through that. It wasn't easy. I had to, you know, talk to, you know, my brother, my mom. I'm like, this is what's going to, you know, what we're doing. They're very supportive of it. You know, I didn't, you know, share it with the world at the time because it wasn't, it wasn't deemed, uh, it would, you know, it wouldn't have probably been the most beneficial. But now I think it's important for people that, you know, if you're going through a tough patch of your life, you know, tough times don't last forever. Tough people do. Um, and it's, it's mm. okay to seek help, right? It's, it's okay to get out there. And, and I think it's the stigma around, um, uh, you know, no one has, everyone's life is just peachy and hunky dory when it's like, no, you, you can. You know, if you're living alone, you know, you know you, things are not going, you're like, it's okay to have and to, to seek outside counsel or, and there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I, I love so that. So that way, no, no, every bit of it. Go ahead, uh, Mike. You know, I was, I was just going to say, I, I love that. And anybody out there um, who, who might be feeling alone or, or feeling like they need to seek help, I mean, reach out to somebody that you love, that you trust, that you care about, and I guarantee you they will support you and they will, they will help you find somebody to help you because um, everybody experiences it. Everybody experiences it. You are not alone. So that, that's very important for people to know. 110% there, 100 Um so I wanted to, Mike, I want yeah. to get into the tech. I think it's yeah. kind of neat. So I, uh, I'm like, hey, I needed, I never worked a corporate job, <laughs> right? So I didn't know, but I've, I've always been good with, like a, one of my skills I've, I've had and I've, you know, people have told me is communication, right? So I've always been on being an effective communicator. You know, when you're a play caller on, you know, being linebacker and deep, you have to communicate, right? You need to go back to your coaches, this is what they're doing on their end, you know, and, you know, things are, it, you, know, you want to rise to the moment, things are going on, everything's happening at full speed, but it's very important to, to sit down, take a deep breath, and like, hey, this is what they're kind of doing. So I needed to know how corporate America worked, right? I knew it was different from sports. You know, I asked friends, like, hey, what is it? You know, some of them are just, they never played sports, so they don't really know what to, like, hey, you, you got your, your leadership, right? You got your hierarchy and who you report to, your bosses, and most times you got clear expectations. Sometimes you don't. So I'm like, hey, I need to get a, a certification uh, in order to, to let people know, my employers, um, that I'm serious about what I'm doing and I'm not just trying to change careers. And, you know, I just I felt like, hey, this is, this is our strategy. Let's get, a, you know, a Cisco CCNA, you know, in the world of networking. This is considered a, you know, entry-level associate more or less, but – if someone gives you their resume, they have that on it, that has no experience, I think it would be a good thing to kind of uh, take a leap of faith on them. Mm. So I, I, I achieved that self-study, passed my test over like, it took me like five times, I'll be honest. It wasn't lightning in a bottle by any means. These tests are pretty hard uh, in the sense of how they, you know, the words and there's timed and, you know, I don't necessarily do the best in tests, but you know, we end up passing it. So I end up getting my first gig um, for endpoint a uh, security company in Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, at the time, they were called Dimension. And then from that, 
I was able to know that I wanted to start my own thing. Uh, but let me gather, you know, certain information about how things work, you know, uh, within this field. So I'm better prep, you know, prepping myself on, hey, this is what I feel like our business plan should be. So we've done that. We're, I was there for about a year and a half. And then I started my first, you know, managed services organization. So when it comes to, you know, athletes um, that are, you know, trying to pivot, you know, just find something that you, you more or less love or just even anybody in general. It can have to be an athlete. Like, hey, I want to pivot. How do I do it? You know, we got to get prepared. We got our planning and execution. And then if you stick to that, um, you know, good things, you know, bumps may come. It's not, you know always, you know, easy route and to say, but at least you have a plan. And, you know, from that, you know, if things don't work, maybe the plan needs to be adjusted, but, you know, that's kind of the sea I swim when it comes to, you know, uh, developing a plan. Even my organization today, we have a new product that we want to bring to market. You know, like you mentioned, we got to, you know, prepare, we got to plan, and then we got to execute. And from that, you know, that process there, um, you know, that's been kind of our success plan, so to speak. Mm, yeah, and I, I want to get into you and and candor and and what it's all about. But there there's there's some things there that I think are very important too for our entrepreneurs to hear. You self learned, you self studied, and uh, I think that that's so important because. Um, a lot of times we as entrepreneurs, we, we might look at ourselves, oh, I'm not good enough or, you know what, that person has that degree, I'm not even going to try for it. But you found different ways, alternative ways to, to learn and to study for this exam. And then just again, I want to touch on this too, because then you experience failure in it. Five times you failed. So I kind of want to get into that grit that, that you had to say after the first failure and say, you know what, I'm going to go back and hit the books and self-study and fail again. Um, let's just get into that a little bit of that grit because I mean, anybody who's listening needs to understand that that's part of the journey is that success comes out of failure. Every bit of it. And to second that, you know, they give you passing grades. It's either a pass fail. And at the end, they kind of give you uh, your, your final score in the areas in which they kind of benchmark you at. You know, I remember on my third test, I got less on my third test than I got on my second. So I really was, you know, fighting some adversity in the sense of like, why am I like, this is not making sense here. Um, but you know, you, you got to have at it, right? I mean, the grid aspect of things is something that I feel that I've developed in sports, but this can be developed at any portion of the time in your life. Right. right? You know, people got to understand that they got to, you control the outcome of, you know, you know, where you're at in the sense of the effort that you put in. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think, truly on that front that, you know, for me, I was like, I gotta, you know, I gotta do something. I'm passionate about this and, you know, I'll keep doing it. Right. Uh, so, so thankfully that particular test didn't have any sort of requirements and how many times you can fail. Uh, Cause I probably would have hit that in a one year. Uh, and I did pay quite a bit on these tests they are pretty pricey, but um, I, I think a lot of it is, you know, the mindset that you have about where you want to be. I mean, you can have people, kind of tell you, hey, you're, you know, this is kind of where I see you or, or doubt you, you know, for us, you know, I can digest that and, and almost create my own reality in the sense that, hey, I'm going to show my own path. Um, and this is the way that we got to do it, right? We're going to, every, it's not going to be all smooth and peachy. Uh, mm -hmm. We got to make sure that we, you know, we apply ourselves, and then from that, you know, good things will come, right? Yeah. And I, I, what, you know, you're, you're talking about passion. I mean, when you're passionate about something, you, you're going to overcome the, the challenges and the failures. And I think like you related it back to playing video games and having a passion for this and, and saying it's to seek something that you love and that you care about, because it's true when, when you really care and you and what you're talking about, too, is visualizing uh, you're, you're visualizing your future and your path. Then those challenges mean nothing to, to some extent, because then you're just like, hey, you know what? That's just part of the path to get to, to where I'm trying to go. And, and I love this so much, I'm just going to keep going. Um, so uh, I, I think that that's also really important to our entrepreneurial journey. So tell us a little bit about the corporate life. So you worked at this com company now, right? So you're in the corporate life. So I'm, I'm kind of smirking here on the end because uh, my entrepreneurial journey is living and working in the corporate world where um, I, I failed over and over at um, because uh, I just didn't have the mindset for that. Yeah, no, I think, you know, what I've noticed is it's more or less navigating more of the bureaucracy, I would say, in this organization. 
um, you know, a lot of the hierarchy of it, it doesn't allow it to be what I, and this is where I applied it to, to my organization. I'd it doesn't allow to hear it that. to be like, right. So it doesn't allow ideas to be shared in the sense of it's more or less, you don't have this title and therefore you need to play your position. You know, and, you know, what we've done for Candor in, in my previous organization is just more or less like the culture needs to be paramount. It needs to be good. So if you have an idea or something that you want to say, like, hey, it's good to, to know that your employees have that have that ability and you're, you're, you're encouraging it because, you know, the whole top down and, you know, scenario in which that I, I'm not a VP, I'm not a director, therefore I got to that shouldn't be what it, you know, we need to be more agile than that. We need to get, make sure that we're getting our best thinkers into play, mm-hmm. especially people that are uh, in the trenches, so to speak, that are customer facing, you know, we encourage it here. If you find there is a, a process in which internally that needs fine tuning or needs to be redefined, let's do it. We let's submit it. Let's talk through the, the intricacies, uh, intricacies of it. Mm-hmm. And let's see if it, you know, from that, um, if we're going to execute on it, like anything else, it's not, you bring up an idea, um, and we're going to, you know, put it to plan, but for the most part, you know, but this gets everybody kind of involved in the whole scenario. I thought, you know, corporate America for my first gig, at least was very siloed. Mm-hmm. It was very head, head down, you're cocking in, you're cocking out, you know, and, you know, from that people are just, you know, showing up for a check rather than, you know, what the end goal may be for the organization, the image, um, you know, what we want to do within the marketplace. And I truly feel um, just like in sports, that is very important aspect of, uh, of a business is, is your employees really buying in uh, into what your vision and uh, your vision is. And, and as far as, you know, where we need to take this organization. Mm, yeah. And, and it kind of goes back to Jeff's, um, uh, excuse me, Jim's uh, list, right, of, of communicate, yep. challenge, and accountability. Um, you know, yep. just, just speaking about it, like, I, I think we, we share that common bond of the corporate world, not the NFL world. <laughs> I, I remember I played, uh, I played flag football with some, some, serious, some serious guys. So I'm from Queens, New York. <laughs> so we're, we're, we're from okay. the boroughs together, you and me. And uh, I played some football with some serious guys once. And, I, and, I, and I'm pretty fast and agile, but I'm a basketball player. And I remember uh, one of the guy's brothers, Pedro, he grabbed me uh he, he was he, he's, he's like a lineman or something i don't really know the positions that well quite honestly and he just grabbed me and i was like i'm good i'm good I, i'm not trying to get past yeah. you man i was like i was like i'm good so we don't share that in common for sure but the corporate world and what you're talking about the silos and the top down and not being able to be creative and embrace um i just want to speak about that and how how we bring that into our cultures today to our company so for candor that is right so i, I noticed some things on your website where i, I think speaks to your culture uh, one, the name of your company, Candor, and what that means, and I, I'd like you to define that for us in, in your own words, not the wiki words. Um, but two, another thing I noticed is you talk about partnership a lot. You don't say customer, you say partners and partnership. And I think that that then, you talk about trickling down, trickles down to your culture of, we're not just looking at someone as a customer, nothing wrong with that, by the way, but the culture that you're creating is that these are our partners that we're working with. So uh, let's speak about that a little bit, creating that culture and enforcing it. Definitely, definitely. You know, for you know, where we thought was the, the candor when we went on our strategy session is more or less that, you know, though we love technology, though we love solving business issues or uh, providing solutions to business issues via technology, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, we need to be customer service friendly, right? We need to make sure that our customers are feeling the love. Uh, a lot of in this space here, uh, Michael, is that, you know, some of our you know, our clients, if you will, like we have a lot of healthcare clients. Uh, they've made the transition from paper charts to EHR, electronic health records. And they're not the most savviest of folks, of course, when it comes to technology. They're probably very much intimidated. But I think, you know, what goes a long way when it comes to uh, providing services is, you know, do people want to work with you? Are you kind to those individuals? Are you respectful? Um, so, you know, a lot of that, we're like, hey, we're going to do Candor Cloud. Because we feel like when it comes to, you know, what we do, we have a, a certain integrity um, as well as, you know, being honest with the customer. And that's, you know, when we set those expectations to customers when it comes to certain issues or solutions, and we back them. We'll, we'll say, hey, 
you know, you need to do a whole upgrade or a whole infrastructure overhaul to address these issues. You're not compliant. You know, you're not going to be able to receive your cybersecurity insurance due to this. You need to be more modern, you know, and, you know, that is information as a trusted advisor that, you know, you want to get from, you know, anybody that you're working with. And, you know, if they want to take kind of our, our assessment or our discovery to another a vendor, I mean, we'll stand behind our work. You know, we're, you know, that's just kind of you know, the the culture that we have here. So uh, fast forward into the candor and how we go about, you know, kind of our solutions on the front of, um, you know, a lot of which that we do is um, we develop uh, strategies for our, our partners, right? So uh, we leverage partner as, you know, Microsoft is one of our partner, mm-hmm. you know, VMware, um, and they, you know, we essentially uh, promote or integrate, you know, their solutions um, being certified. And it's kind of a give and take when it comes to that, um, that environment. But, we're, you know, the reality of it uh, when it comes to what we're, where we're at today is that you need to leverage partners, right? Uh, you know, there's going to be certain aspects of things that you can't do in-house. Mm-hmm. And then you need, and the partner community is, you know, we're not going to hire a full-time plumber, you know, I would say in his analogy, we're going to leverage, you know, a partner that maybe will come in and, and, you know, leverage that when something breaks. The same idea when it comes to the partner community. Um, we leverage them for their solutions, and we build kind of our solutions based on that, based on the customer needs. So it's really much tailored to uh, the end customer when it comes to, um, you know, how we approach things. Um, you know, here at Candor, right? And uh, we're always, you know, we're always open. We're always syncing. We're always providing feedback on the behalf of, you know, how to make the product better. Some of our our customers' feedback as well. And I feel like, you know, when you're when you're taking that, you know, uh, information and applying it, we're in this ever changing uh, environment or, or uh, vertical with technology, right? We talk about a lot of things with, with cloud and, and how that's kind of rapidly changing. You know, 5G is on the horizon when it comes to any sort of bandwidth uh, limitations that um, current applications need in order to provide um, that excellent user experience. So it's, it's a very much exciting time to be alive uh, on the technology front. Mm, yeah, you know, um, you brought up cyber cybersecurity insurance uh, because uh, because of my insurance background. I, I appreciate that. Um, you know, and and you're talking about the technology front, and there is so much happening in, in the technology world that your industry, the the term IT is no longer clear. Quite honestly, um, <laughs> so I would just like to just identify what Candor does, just for everybody to understand what we're talking about here, um, and the Candor Cloud, what it does exactly for these these organizations sure sure so um candor is uh we're essentially business solution providers it consultants so we provide you know uh solutions on the based on the the use case of the organization Um, we help um customers and partners navigate the so-called cloud and where it's applicable uh within your organization you know we definitely want to be a part of you know uh, an area in which we're the barrier of entry for small medium-sized business as well as enterprise has been dropped due to the cloud, right? Mm-hmm. Now it's more of the subscription-based approach, um, which can, you know, essentially get everybody within needing IT presence, like every organization in, that's running a business would need some sort of form of presence. And we basically take that and we want our customers um, to really know that we're building these solutions to help facilitate you, your business in the marketplace. So let it be from any sort of data modeling initiative. A lot of what we do for um, our, one of our initiatives right now is Candor Health. And Candor Health is addressing the compliance as well as the security and the patient-provider relationship uh, within the healthcare industry. And we feel as if uh, we all can benefit from that. Um, any, any aspect of leveraging technology, let it be from virtual health, um, to be able to provide a dictation into a patient charts um, is an area in which that we want to be a part of because we all can benefit from that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, alongside that initiative there, Michael, is that we're doing, um, we're addressing the provider fatigue, right? Uh, provider fatigue is a real thing. Um, providers are logging into all these different systems. They all have their different usernames and passwords, and we're developing ways in which that we can, you know, leverage a, what we call a single sign-on experience 
So a doctor can just go ahead and badge in and, you know, from there get access to whatever secure information that is needed. So uh, we're very much, you know, listening to our uh, our healthcare uh, physicians and, and doctors on, you know, some of the aspects and limitations within their uh, technology that would help them provide, you know, better uh, patient experience. So. Mm. And, and, you know, that applies to a lot of different fields, right? So I, I'm, I'm interested to know if, if your company, which I, I believe it does, expands to these different fields and, and maybe how small an organization to how big. I, I'll just share with you. For me, uh, I just started my insurance uh, company, which is... Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm using technology to, to sell insurance is really what it is. So Den 10 Insurance Services is an insurance agency, but we actually, our website is den10.io. And the reason why I chose IO okay. is because I want to build out a platform that exactly what you just said makes it easy for my agents um, to, to be able to access all the information without multiple logins. And then I believe that down the road, we'd be able to provide that for franchisees and for different uh, business owners in the insurance world where it's just a simple program to use because what I'm experiencing right now as I build out this company is I have to buy multiple platforms for different for different things and like you just said I have multiple logins and there's duplicate processes so I am interested into um, does it does it apply to the insurance world and uh, and then I, again for for those listening for entrepreneurs listening and business leaders listening if if candor it might be a good fit for them is how, you know how big and how small the businesses are that you work with yeah sure so our, our sweet and just to answer we can do that integration on your on your systems on the behalf of that. And, uh, you know, a lot of these things we got to, you know, check the box that there's APIs available to have these um, different solutions kind of talk, mm. but essentially it's the same idea, right? We want to ma- manage or maintain one identity uh, for these multiple systems. Obviously it has to be secure, right? Maybe two factor authentication or, uh, will be applicable. So, and these are the type of things that, you know, what we do at Candor as far as our due diligence uh, when it comes to this. So, uh, Michael, I'll be happy to help you out on that. I'm sure we can uh, get something going, of course. Um, yeah, so, you know, our sweet spot is the medium-sized businesses, right? You know, I'll, I'll be honest. We have enterprise. Uh, we do a lot in the physician, private physician networks um, that are not owned by a hospital. They're more or less kind of, you know, doing things between the providers. The providers own the business. Um, and, you know, in that, so under 500 uh, to a thousand, 500 to 1,000 is kind of our area in which that we do very much, uh, we, we go after, right? Um, mm-hmm. Not to say, again, we have bigger organizations. There is a managed services aspect of what we do today. Um, and that was one thing with being an entrepreneur as well is that you want, you know, it, I'm not ashamed to tell someone like, hey, you're a 10,000 user org. I can't manage that. Not the way I want to, right? I'm not going to go hire, you know, uh, third party, all our employees are, or all our staff is employed uh, by Candor, and I feel like there's a, a reputation when it comes to a level of service that I feel is satisfactory that, you know, we need to maintain. Obviously, when it comes to project related stuff, you know, that's you know, it, that's a difference. Um, but I think you know, one thing I would say, what I've learned um, is that you know, you want to boil the ocean when it comes to like, hey, yeah, I can do the customer here. That's a sweet spot for me. You know, we like to say is healthcare, you know, financial services and nonprofits are kind of the verticals that we pursue and we're very good at. Um, uh, and, you know, that's kind of a little tidbit so, you know, based on kind of our... Yeah, and, and you know that that's great. So it's funny because we're, we're we're talking about your company, but this still relates to the entrepreneurs listening and to the business leaders out there. Is that um, what you're talking about here is your niche, right? And it's so important to identify that because so many businesses and so many entrepreneurs fail because they don't identify what they're good at. And you just mentioned it with either overstretching and then not performing at the level that one that they expect of themselves, but then two that the client or customer expects of them. And so that's really, really important that you touched on that is that you at Candor and you're, and then we're going to, I want to talk about your W2s as well, but you at Candor uh, have identified that, you know, your markets, you know, your verticals that you work in and, and you play really well in there. And then as you get better at what you do, right, then you can start expanding. But first you maximize what you can do in, in those different verticals. And then the, the second part to this, which you mentioned, which was 
W-2s being, they are employees. And that goes back to us talking about culture, right? It's like, how do you create a culture if you're con- con- continuously outsourcing? And like you said, of course, project base and different partners, that, that's one thing. But if you're continuously outsourcing employees, um, how do you create a culture, right? You, you create it by somebody knowing that when they get their paycheck, it's from Candor, it's from the company that they're signed on with, right? Without a doubt. And that's, you know, the, the most important thing, I'm, I'm sure a lot of entrepreneurs will stress the fact is that we need to get people buying in. They need to feel like they're, they're valued. Um, and the culture is, is more or less, you know, people go to work and, and we support the, the work from remote model. So we're leveraging all the technology that we're kind of implementing on the, on the behalf of our, our customers uh, in our own business, right? From, we got employees in Virginia, from, I'm in Arizona myself, uh, Florida, uh, California. And, you know, one way, again, with bandwidth being available and what have is just, I need self-starters. I need people that are uh, enthusiastic about technology, that want to be part of a, uh, a growing company where we are providing uh, very much a lot of services that are needed. And, you know, from that, you know, the culture, I'll, I'll make sure the culture is good because I know how to, you know, on the technical aspect, I know what's interest or what interests technical uh, folks and, you know, they want training. You know, they don't want to be the smartest person in the room. They want to be able to, to rely on other individuals and their relative, you know, fields on, you know, information. And, you know, we're, we're able to provide that. So, I, you know, I can't stress culture enough. Uh, you know, the employees that we have, we have about 26 today. Um, they're fantastic. Um, and, uh, I can't say enough nice things about them. You know, and as we start to obviously conclude this episode, because we, we've been on for a little bit and, and you're a CEO of a company and, and trying to, trying to run an organization. So on that topic of running an organization and, and communication being one of the common themes throughout your football career and then throughout your, your, your life after football, how are you communicating with these different employees that are kind of like all over the country, right? So you're obviously doing it through zoom or, or some sort of teams of some sort, but speak a little bit about that communication and keeping that unity, uh, virtually? Yeah. So we have, you know, our cloud team, uh, consists of about 14 individuals. So we have two different meetings, um, throughout the week, um, basically, uh, every other day through Monday through Friday. So we got Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and we keep our, our, our communication. We do Microsoft, we're a Microsoft shop. Um, we do keep our communication flowing throughout uh, the day. So, um, you know, an event, we do have employees that are, are living alone that I have to do, be mindful of is that, you know, your four-cornered office can start to shrink a little bit. Um, and, you know, we try to sync with them or have them get out and work remotely somewhere um, if they're comfortable doing that. But I'll, I will call them and make sure that they're, you know, how's their morale, how they're doing, did they need any help? Um, so it's always this kind of continuous improvement process when it comes to this model, right? Because, you know, I don't, I don't want any corporate leases in the sense of I, I'm not interested in that. I'd rather put my money into uh, data centers and, and building out our solutions, uh, knowing this model works. Uh, obviously, we need self-starters. Uh, you know, I don't want to ride anybody to get work done. Um, and, and fortunately for us, we, we haven't ran into much of that uh, here for Candor. But, you know, uh, it's a lot of uh, touch base through uh, mechanisms within teams and the collaboration and just start to, you know, I read the room pretty good when it comes to, you know, where people are at and, you know, and, you know, from there I, I'm able to, to, to address it effectively, I would say. Yeah. So let it be from, hey, maybe you know, let's, I'll send you a, you know, a, a dinner plan here. Go ahead, have a fun, you know, just stuff to be mindful of this. Cause again, you know, uh, where we're at and you know, hopefully things start to continue on this trajectory of staying open, you know, COVID was pretty scary for folks, so. Mm, yeah, and, and that's really kind of like where the, the base behind that question is because that's where the the, the world has shifted to is that is that we're, we're shifting to this virtual model. My my agency, we're, we're a virtual agency. COVID allowed us to do that because the insurance world, they, they want you to have a brick and mortar, but they realize that they could no longer force agents to have a brick and mortar. Um, you know, you mentioned again, you, you reach out, you call your employees to check in on them. And what I like about what you just said there is, 
you're not calling them to see if they're working. You're calling them to see if they're going outside, which is so important, and putting together meal plans. And um, again, that just speaks back to the culture of like, who wouldn't want to work for someone who's calling and saying, hey, did you get to walk outside yet? Actually, you know, it's, that's the cool thing about what we do, man. I, I truly care about, you know, these folks and I care about their, their mental and where they're at. And it's, you know, having that in your organization will go a long way. Mm-hmm. So the camaraderie from sports, mm-hmm. you know, that's the thing I miss most, right, is sweat in my eyes during uh, the summertime because, you know, initially your eyes don't get used to it for until like a couple, like I'll say a week or so, and all of a sudden the sweat's in your eyes, it, it doesn't bother them anymore. Mm-hmm. But in the commodity, right? We're all moving to the same goal. Um, and I, I believe, you know, though it's not the same as sports right now, I can apply a lot of that to the business. And I want people to feel like they're appreciated. And, you know, from that, you know, why not check in, right? Make sure they're, they're doing well. And, and, you know, you mentioned kind of your, your virtual. Um, so that was one thing about we see being the you know, COVID fast-tracked it. We were doing deployments last year uh, via code for the would-be um, employees behind, you know, their corporate firewall and their corporate location to this now spread out workforce. But like anything else, uh, as you know, the security aspects is there as well. So we're deploying a lot of these solutions um, that were secure um, in a manner in which that, hey, I'm IT. I don't know what I don't know. I wasn't planned for this, but it looks like we're not going back in the office. Right. What do you have for us? You know, so it's just kind of COVID fast track that. So. It, it has. And so speaking of fast track and goals and visions and going into the future here, um, you know, candor, it's, it's kind of new, right? It's in its baby stage. It's still crawling a little bit, right? Um, where, where do you see candor in the next five, 10 years or, or what's your vision or goal for it? So uh, one of the strategic uh, visions that I have is more or less uh, providing a lot of uh, business intelligence um, reporting, like dashboards, right? I think in the near future, we're doing this today. I really want to mature this aspect to the business because I really feel as if since the barrier of entry has, you know, has dropped significantly, you know, who doesn't want to have data-driven decisions, right? Where I'm like, hey, this is the market that we want to, to go after. Here's the why. And then from that, provide these kind of, you know, uh, self-driven dashboard reports, leveraging Power BI or Tableau uh, as the front end. And I want to be able to go to the market more with this uh, to help other, you know, organizations when it comes to some of their deficiencies and what, what they do what, and why they do it, right? Uh, you know, that would be, you know, kind of the fight and have that really be turnkey, you know, find different ways to uh, make that selling process a lot easier for uh, would-be prospects. You know, today, you know, we got to pivot. I tell organizations is that, you know, some of these organizations are like the Titanic, right? Mm-hmm. Trying to move the, pivot the Titanic with a toothpick. You know, I like to think of ourselves as that we're F-35 fighter jet. So if there's things down the road that we see that, hey, this is going to be a disruption, I want to be in front of that, mm-hmm. you know, sort of just like work, the remote work from home model. We've been doing this since the inception. So a lot of the aspects when it comes to are my employees working or not, this is all task oriented. Everyone has a job. As long as they're knocking out some of their tasks for their job, I'm okay with it based on, you know, certain job responsibilities. So um, I'd like to make more of a, uh, a pivot into uh, more global, right? So we have a, um, an opportunity in South America uh, to be able to provide uh, services on the behalf of a partner there uh, looking to uh, leverage us for some of our cloud capabilities. But, you know, I, I really see this thing being global. Um, I want to, I'm in it for the long haul in the sense of, you know, doing what I love here. Um, and, you know, I think from the business intelligence aspects and, and as well as, you know, developing the right, you know, go-to-market strategy for growth, you know, I think uh, the future for Candor is very promising. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, it, it certainly is. And, and going global. And, and uh, again, you touched on passion. And, and again, you know, as, as an entrepreneur, as a business leader, someone out there who's, who's trying to go after a goal or a dream, uh, as long as you're passionate about it, I think you're also speaking about patience in there, about that you, you know it's a, you're in it for the long haul. So be patient and realize that it's going to take a while. You're going to have some speed bumps in the way. Uh, maybe it'll take you five yep. times to pass an exam, but you will pass it. And then you will be where, where, where Dave is 
today. Uh, Dave, as we conclude, um, I just, you know, you, I, I, I typically ask in my intake forms a question about like advice that you would give yourself 10 years from today. And some people give themselves specific advice, but you came, came back with a very philosophical uh, answer. And I, I would like you to just share that with everybody about the advice that you would give yourself 10 years from, from now. I think, uh, you know, one of those things, I, it doesn't happen so often. I think meditation and just kind of, you know, therapy, like, you know, if you beat yourself up about something that you did and it's just stealing space in your head, right? Mm-hmm. It's just like you did something you're not the most proud of um, and you're in there like, in, like it, it's not productive, right? It's just almost like it, it goes through this, this loop. We call it monkey brain. Some people may call it something different. Um, so I think, you know, I was a lot busy trying to ensure I was making the correct decision, right? Just out of the gate, like, how do, we, how do you know it's the correct decision, right? Um, uh, which is stressful, right? It's almost paralysis in the sense, like, how am I know I'm going to make the, the best decision? But, you know, I think, you know, my mistakes have been the best lessons, right, mm. um, in my eyes, right? Just to be in like, hey, that, that went pretty sideways, Dave. Um, so just learning from you know, your, your mistakes will help you grow, and then, you know, like anything else, no one wants to make a mistake, right? I get it. Uh, but I think the best thing to kind of make that situation uh, turn into a positive, which is what we want to do, we want to make these, these things turn into a positive for us in our development, is that mistakes are often the best teachers. Mm. And so instead of trying to eggshell and just make sure you're like, well, I, I think it's more or less, you know, I found a way not to do it that won't work. Oh, I've done that before, right? Mm. Or no, I wouldn't suggest that. And just more or less, uh, you know, not beating yourself dead for things that you've done in your past and mistakes that you've had and, and learn to, you know, I think laugh at yourself and smile. I think from there, you know, things will fall in, fall in line. So if I had to tell the young Dave Philistine back 10 years ago is that uh, don't be afraid to make a mistake and, and you're pretty hard on yourself about things that has already concluded and I feel like uh, I didn't necessarily need to be doing that, so... Mm. Yeah, my my mindful living coach. The, the, so my coaches aren't football coaches; they're mindful living coaches. <laughs> His name is is Matt Alfonso, and and he would he would say, "Give yourself some grace." And uh, anybody listening out there, just give yourself some grace, and, and it's going to be all right. And and one thing I do for Michael for preparation is that you know it, it, this helps me so mentally, and then we use this internally too. Is that things are not going to get any easier; we got to get better. Mm. So I, I really stress that, you know, like, how do, what does that mean? Like, do we get better with automation? Do we get better of addressing it a different way? Um, and I feel like if you have that mindset going to, you know, it's, it's not going to, you know, it's winter time, right? And back in the Northeast, right? It's going to be cold tomorrow. So what can we do to maybe we get an automatic car starter? We start, you know, just, right. it's not going to get any easier. We just got to get better. And I think, you know, that's the C kind of, um, which, which helped me and hopefully it will help some of the, the viewers and listeners as well. Mm, well, thank you very much for, for sharing all that. It's been, it's been a pleasure uh, getting to interview you and getting to know you on a personal level because for me, uh, as I said, you know, I'm, I, I play basketball. I've never played and, and I didn't make my high school team. I didn't make any team, but I always continued to play basketball, watch sports, uh, you know, a big Jordan fan, of course. And then I became a, a big LeBron fan. Um, so sports has played a big impact in my life. So whenever I meet another athlete, it's just like, it's, it's amazing to me. It's just, you know, even whether, whether I know know who they are or not it's just it's just uh, I get a different feeling so uh, I was really excited to meet you today I was talking about you uh, to, to our 10 to my 10 year old friend my, my, my daughter's uh, best friend's little brother I was like I'm gonna I'm gonna interview this NFL football player and we were like googling you and checking out your pictures uh, from the Seahawks so this has been really really an honor to, to get to to get to know you uh, get to relate sports to entrepreneurship um, which which I think uh, is is just huge and there's a great correlation there uh, Dave, if there's any way that someone can reach out to you, could you just share any handles or email addresses that you'd like to share with our public? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so I can be reached at uh, Dave at Candor, C-A-N-D-O-R dot cloud. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn. Um, you can just go with me by, by name of, uh, you know, Dave uh, Philistine. Um, uh but, uh, Michael, oh. I do appreciate it. Uh, I think this has been fantastic. Now I know you're Haitian. I've got to tell my <laughs> brother here uh, on our end. But, you know, I think what you're doing here is, is fabulous for the, the business community and entrepreneurs. I think, 
you know, from these stories and we're, you know, I hope that, um, you know, anybody who's listening and tuned in is find this inspirational and, and, you know, you can apply it and obviously you can reach out to me if you have any additional questions or feedback on it, but yeah, you're a good man. And, and thanks again for, uh, you know, having me on. Same here. Same here, Dave. All right. Well, thanks everyone. Um, and if, if you'd like, you're going to be able to get an invitation to our live event and you'll be able to meet Dave at our live event. It is virtually live. It's going to be on Facebook live at one of our kickoffs. That'll be down the road and everybody will see that in the emails. Hello, all my entrepreneurs and business leaders, and welcome to the Michael Esposito Show, where I interview titans of industry in order to inform, educate, and inspire you to be great. On the website. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Thank you for listening to the Michael Esposito Show. For show notes, video clips, and more episodes, go to michaelespositoinc.com backslash podcast.